Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle Wine, and I'm the Trade Policy Analyst here at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Intellectual Basis of Trade Policy Trench Warfare. Uh, we have a wonderful panel with us this morning. Uh, Josh Meltzer from the, uh, <coughs> is a fellow in the Global Economy and Development at the Brookings Institution, and an adjunct professor at the John Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies. <coughs> Prior to joining Brookings, Dr. Meltzer was a trade negotiator and legal advisor with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, Miriam Sapir is a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution in the Global Economy and Development Program. Ambassador Sapir served as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative from 2009 to 2014 and also as Acting U.S. Trade Representative. And then Ambassador John Verano is a partner at Covington and Berlin LLP in the Washington, D.C. office. He also served as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative uh, from 2006 to 2009, where he had broad supervisory responsibilities over U.S. trade policy. And to uh, kick off our event, we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Robert Atkinson, President and Founder of ITIF, who's going to tell us a little bit about the report. Thanks so much. Okay, well, thank you, Michelle, and uh, welcome, everybody. Glad you can join us this morning. So. sense that it largely resembles trench warfare. So if you think about, it, you know, are we going to pass uh, TPA, are we going to pass TPP, it's really a question of sort of who makes the largest assault, who puts the most troops forward. Uh, it's not about convincing one side or the other. It's not about even, because each side is so firmly convinced that their position is right and the other position is the source of all evil. And it's not about negotiation or compromise. There's many other issues, like tax policy. Eventually, we'll have corporate tax reform. Then there'll be this complex negotiation and compromise. Trade policy seems different. And what I want to do today on a report that Michelle and I wrote that drills down into what's the underlying intellectual basis of that. I don't think it fundamentally is about interest defined in the sort of Lockean sense about people defending their, their self-interest or their economic interests. I really think it's fundamentally about economic ideology, economic doctrines, economic worldviews that then go and inform trade policy. So this is really all about a basis of this notion of economic doctrines, which if you've followed our work, it's an area we've written about for many, many years. And what we've argued is there's really these, these competing economic doctrines, that economics is not a science. As much as sort of the conventional neoclassical economists, many of them at Brookings uh, or API or really any think tank in the U in, in Washington, other than us, uh, they have this view that what they're doing is science. And everybody else is an amateur who cannot even talk about economics because they're not true economists. Uh, in fact, economics is not a science. <clears throat> it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a pseudoscience or a quasi-science, if you will. It's, it's really dependent upon the initial premises that one when someone holds. And so there's really, if you will, three main economic doctrines. Uh, now, I, I should do a quiz to see how many people know who all those three people are. I would assume it's pretty obvious that Ben Bernanke here, who represents sort of the conventional view of economics, what's called the neoclassical economics view. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, obviously Keynesian economics named after him, and then our hero, Joseph Schumpeter, the uh, author of many, many books, and then sort of these great phrases like creative destruction. So there's really these three competing economic doctrines. This one, uh, the Bernanke doctrine, if you will, the neoclassical economic doctrine, is the dominant one. Probably 80% of economists in Washington are subscribers to that view. Uh, and that view is largely that markets work, and the most important thing is what's called allocation efficiency. So really all you need to do if you're an economist is just get prices right. Supply and demand curves will take care of all the rest. Just get prices right, everything's hunky dory. Keynesian economics is really all about demand side economics. If you just keep consumer demand up or even business demand, the economy will stay at full employment. That's all you need to worry about. 
And then Schubertarian economics, or what we would call innovation economics, is really fundamentally different. It says the goal of economic policy is to drive innovation and productivity. Markets generally work, but oftentimes they don't work, particularly in innovation industries, and you need active policies. So if you want to find out what type of economist you are, even if you've never taken an economist economics course, you can go to this little web, this little test here. Uh, it takes you about 15, 10 minutes, and at the bottom will pop up a picture of an economist, and it'll tell you kind of what your thinking is like. A lot of fun. So this is it. This is trade policy today. It's really all about who can get the most troops over over the hill to take the next hill and win. Okay, so what we have are the neoclassical free traders who sees their goal in life is to combat protectionists, uh, and, and particularly domestic protectionists. Uh, they don't seem to care all that much about foreign protectionists. It's let's slay the domestic protectionists who don't really get it, don't understand it. The other component, I think, of this debate is that each side is just convinced that they just talk a little more loud, a little more loudly, and a little more slowly that they will convince the other side because Clearly, there's something the other side just isn't getting. Uh, the Keynesian protectionists, this sort of the, the extreme wing of the Keynesian protectionists, which is that trade is largely a capitalist conspiracy designed to hold the working class in chains uh, and to particularly oppress people all around the world. Um, and not all Keynesians have that extreme of view, uh, or not all progressives have that extreme of view, but it's, it, it's sort of in there. Um, and then finally, I've, I've stolen a term that John Barano had the other recently, which I just love, uh, which is a, uh, innovation economists, people who sort of, and they're reluctant free traders. I guess that's, I love that phrase. It's just, it's, so I'm a reluctant free trader. I love free trade. I love globalization, but I'm sort of reluctant about it uh, because of the way it's structured, and I'll get into that in a moment. But uh, so there's this third camp, if you will, that embraces globalization, understands the importance of free market, of, 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 of free trade, but says, hold on, there's some, there's some key components here and caveats that we've got to get right if that's going to work. All right, so what's the neoclassical economic doctrine when it comes to trade? It's really based on a number of key principles. And I think if you sort of embrace these principles, all of the policy recommendations and positions uh, stem quite clearly from it. So the most important one is that the goal of trade is to maximize what's called allocation efficiency. And what that means is if you're ha you have uh, two economies, one is producing wine and one is producing textiles, what you want to do is make sure that you're not distorting where those textiles and wine are produced and that you sort of produce them in the right place at the right amount. And so the notion is that trade is a way to allocate existing resources into the right amounts. And that the goal here is not about producer welfare. The goal is about consumer welfare. And that's an important point because it essentially means that we don't care fundamentally about what happens to producers or workers. What we really fundamentally care about is what, how do consumers fare in the short run. Um, the other component, I think, of, of trade is of the neoclassical view is that they hold this view that Trade, by definition, is voluntary. If I'm going to sell John uh, uh, this bottle of water, he's going to give me that book. And, uh, he's doing it because he thinks that water is more valuable than I think, and I think the book is more valuable. So we'll engage in a trade, and both our welfare basically went up, what economists call Pareto optimality. Uh, now, as I was talking about a little earlier, a little later, the problem is that not all trade is voluntary. Uh, just look at China. Uh, you have uh, essentially market power, or in this case, government power, that can change the terms of trade. Uh, but because trade is voluntary, by definition in the neoclassical view, it cannot cause any harm. Now, it might cause harm to individual companies who, who might lose on that, but from a net basis, the key component of neoclassical economic trade theory is it is always welfare maximizing for a country. <coughs> Well, another component of that, which you hear all the time, is we shouldn't really be worried about unfair foreign trade practices uh, for two reasons. One, if, if the trade practices are, are subsidies, in other words, if these countries are stupid enough to dump their products, I meaning sell them below price, or give massive subsidies for exports, 
why would we not take that subsidy and we benefit because our consumers now have access to lower priced products. This is a great thing for us and if they're so too stupid to figure out that they're doing something wrong, violating economic theory, we should just take advantage of that. Now the problem with that is that pretty much everybody in this room is both a consumer and a worker. And so if you're only looking at consumer welfare, foreign subsidies are good. If you're looking at our roles as both producers and consumers, foreign subsidies can be bad if they destroy productive capacity. But even when the mercantilist actions aren't about, aren't about subsidies for us, they're just about doing bad things, uh, like forced technology transfer, weak intellectual property protection, uh, standards manipulation, a whole litany of things that we've written about. The neoclassicists will say, and I've heard this quote, Adam Smith proved that mercantilists only hurt themselves. So again, it's this sort of deep-seated conceit that there's only one way to grow an economy, and it goes along the neoclassical lines. And if you're too uh, ill-advised and ill-informed to violate that, so you put in place these strange policies like weak intellectual property protection, ultimately you're hurting yourself. The problem with that is maybe you're hurting yourself, but you're also hurting the global trading system. You're also hurting the US producers. Another component there is competitive advantage is a given. I use the example of wine and textiles, the famous Ricardian example of Portuguese wine and British textiles, which is a good thing. It was because you didn't want English wine, and <laughs> Portuguese didn't know how to make textiles. So they was trade, and everybody was happy. But in the neoclassical view of trade, there's no such thing as competitive advantage. So Portugal should stay with wine till the end of time, and Britain should stay with textiles till the end of time. The problem is that in the old theory, when a lot of the economy was around natural goods production, that made a certain amount of sense. You know, you don't want to be a wine producer if you're, if you're in England because you don't have any grapes and uh, you know, Portugal is a beautiful place, beautiful lots of sun. The problem is in the new global economy that's technology based, why, for example, do the Japanese and the Koreans seem to have some kind of competitive advantage in robots? Uh, is it because of the weather? Or is it because of uh, the fact that you know Japan is an island? I mean, no, it's because they said we want to be good at robots. We think robots are an important technology. So the notion of competitive advantage is given is, 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 I think, just mistaken. There's a notion of what's called comparative advantage. Excuse me. Um, it actually should be comparative advantage. My apologies. Comparative advantage is given. They don't acknowledge competitive advantage. Okay. And the last part of neoclassical economics and trade is this notion that all industries are equal. The famous uh, Michael Boskin line when he was in, uh, in the first Bush administration as head of CDA, potato chips, computer chips, what's the difference? The difference is uh, that potato chips don't really have a lot of positive spillovers. <clears throat> it's not like we can say, boy, Moore's law is really working great in the potato chip industry. The prices are going down by half every 18 months, and uh, we're all getting fat. Semiconductors, biotechnology, aviation, all of these high-tech industries have giant what economists call spillovers. And uh, they're very, very hard to replicate. If we were to lose a Boeing or an Intel, for example, uh, we wouldn't replace them overnight. Uh, very, very hard to replace them. So again, the neoclassical view is that no industry more important than another. Uh, and so if we lose an industry, in fact, you hear neoclassical economists say this all the time. If we were to lose high-tech production because the Chinese manipulate their currency and have unfair trade practices around technology, we would just get into another industry. Well, what's the other industry that is higher value added than technology industries? The answer is there's none. Okay, what's the neoclassical view on all this? Um, uh, this would be uh, emblematic of groups like the Economic Policy Institute, the AFL-CIO, uh, you know, groups on the left, and, and their view of trade policy is quite different. Uh, and it goes back to this notion of Keynesian economics. What you want in Keynesian economics is robust demand, consumer demand, that keeps employment high. Now, if trade threatens that by holding down wages, then uh, this is a problem because you can't get economic growth in this theory. The other key component of the Keynesian view of the world is that what you want is you want a whole set of government policies and supports to keep wages and benefits high. 
So you want uh, health insurance, you want robust environmental protection, you want all of these things, which I'm not saying are bad. The, word, the problem with trade for a Keynesian is that they have this view that it's a race to the bottom and that more competition, global competition, while it may spur enterprises to be more innovative and enterprises to be more competitive, it has this effect of basically driving down wages, driving down other kinds of worker protections. So in their view, trade reduces welfare. It's very interesting because you can have these, you can have a debate about TPP. Neoclassicals will say TPP is going to improve overall U.S. welfare. The Keynesian left will say no, no, TPP will reduce overall economic welfare. It can't be both of those. One of them has to be right, or perhaps TPP has no effect on anything, uh, which I dispute. Okay, I just want to point out this other component because I think it, I think it's interesting. There's another component of, uh, of, of the left-wing view of trade, which is what I call the global neo-Keynesians. And this is emblematic. The, the, the person who sort of typifies this and really is the farthest out in advocating for this view of trade is Joe Stieglitz. And I think if anybody read Joe Stieglitz's New York Times piece really uh, recently, uh, I think it was New York Times, yeah, regaling against TPP and why it was bad. Um, Unlike domestic NKs like EPI, EPI at least EPI, uh, their goal and they're unabashedly about it is to protect the interest of U.S. workers. Seems to make sense if you're in the U.S. Stieglitz's goal and folks who abide by his view is not about U.S. workers. It's protect low-income workers in developing countries. So Stieglitz is more than happy in his views and in his writing to give up on the interest of U.S. workers to have advanced policies that would be detrimental to the interest of U.S. workers. Because as, as he's written, U.S. workers do quite well in global economy. They make a lot more money than Indian workers or Ethiopian workers. And so Stiglitz is essentially saying we should have trade policy that's designed completely for the interest of workers in developing countries. That means virtually no intellectual property protection. That means allowing mercantilist practices like currency manipulation and forced tech transfer. That means no response by us to these practices. And it means eliminating all tariffs on in inbound products and services from these countries, regardless of their practices. You know, again, you know, if Stieglitz wants to add, advance that view, that's his right. And, and at one level, you can say, well, that there's something to that, because workers are poor in those countries. My only complaint about Stieglitz is he needs to be upfront about that. So we're having a debate about U.S. trade policy, and he's advocating against TPP or other policies. He should just be right up front and say, my interests are not about American economic interests. My interests are to help poor people in developing countries. Then you can have a debate. Well, do we want that or don't we want that? But the way Stieglitz frames it, this is all a global conspiracy to, uh, to hurt development. Okay. Now we come to the really the right position, which I hope to convince you of, uh, which would be the innovation economics uh, position when it comes to trade. So what's the goal of trade in an in innovation economics perspective? Why do we want trade? Well, frankly, it isn't allocation efficiency. When you look at the gains from trade on allocation efficiency, they're frankly very minor. You know, really, does it matter whether the Japanese make a few more autos and we make a few more machine tools? It, that's not a big deal. That's quite a small deal. Why trade matters, I think, is, it, is about how global integration drives innovation and productivity. So it does that through a number of different ways. One is through competition. So having trade forces, forces enterprises to be more competitive and to be more innovative. Now, the caveat is having trade based upon market forces. There's a lot of evidence that just come out recently. There's a new NPER paper, uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research paper. Very, very strong, convincing paper, which I can't remember you know, who wrote it, but I'm happy to share it with anybody. Uh, this came out about two weeks ago. And, and what the paper showed um, was that US companies have cut their research, in, their basic and applied research over the last decade significantly. Uh, they've improved their patenting and they've cut their, now how can that happen? How can they go patenting up research? Now, China, that's basically what this analysis finds, is the competitive pressures from China, because of unfair trade practices like currency manipulation, intellectual property theft, standards manipulation, et cetera, 
and forced U.S. companies into a much more shorter term and less strategic perspective. So they invest in, in development, not basic research. They patent more because they want, they feel they need stronger patent protection against uh, Chinese unfair practices. I'm not sure how much patent it helps them in China, but uh, in any case, it's an interesting notion. So focus is on long-term welfare. Third component is uh, innovation economists would argue that mercantilism or unfair trade practices, foreign protectionism, whatever you want to call it, is actually quite a serious problem. And a problem that hurts not just the global innovation economy, but it hurts the U.S. economy. Uh, and again, the key thing there, I gave a talk recently at the National Defense University, and somebody came up afterward and said, I couldn't tell if you're a protectionist or a free trader. And I said, well, that's fantastic. That's exactly where I want to be. Because I don't think these terms are the right terms. Are you a free trader or are you a protectionist? I think it's a little bit like John said, you know, reluctant free trader uh, or, you know, reluctant protectionist, whatever. So the notion is mercantilism hurts us, and we need to have active policies that counter it, that work against it. Active policies from the World Bank, uh, from the IMF, from the WTO, from the USG. Uh, and essentially, the notion of trade does work for the U.S. interests. Global integration is good for the U.S., but not if mercantilism is rampant. Uh, obviously, I mentioned this before. Our trade policy should be oriented to helping us specialize in high-value-added innovation-based production. That is perhaps the most controversial thing I say today. I don't really care too much about hog production, nor do I care too much about chicken production. And yet, our trade policy seems to put those things on an equal par. Uh, and I don't mean to be crass. I mean, yes, it'd be nice if the Chinese would open up their frozen poultry uh, you know, imports. But if you're making strategic choices on trade policy, where should we be making those? And our, our argument would be we should be focusing on what our real competitive advantage is, and that's high value added production. Okay. So is there a path forward? Is there a way to get trade policy out of its trench warfare characteristics? Um, <coughs> and being the eternal optimist, uh, I was actually going to put like a 60s peace sign up there with a bunch of hippies, but I said that's probably a little too much. I, I would argue that there is a way forward if we can have people, uh, all, the, all, the, uh, in, all the people engaged in this debate to sort of step back a bit, reevaluate some assumptions, and rethink how they do this. And I would argue for NCs, neoclassical, you know, they need to have two sort of core changes in their thinking. The first is that a robust anti-mercantilism policy is not about us being protectionist. You hear this constantly, well, we can't respond to China. That would make us protectionist. Protectionism in the sake of fighting foreign protectionism is not protectionism. It's free trade. So if we decide, for example, in the solar case against China that we're going to impose duties because they were massively dumping solar panels, that's not protectionism. That is fighting for free trade. If you don't engage rampant, uh, sort of unreconstructed mercantilists with real consequences, they will just keep doing what they're doing. So that's number one. We need to complement a robust trade opening agenda, like TPP, like uh, TTIP, and other uh, TISA, uh, TPI, uh, um, um, other ones. We need to complement that with an aggressive mercantilist policy. Now, part of the challenge for U.S. carriers is resources. They're, they're under-resourced. They don't have the staff it takes to be able to do that. But part of it is also just overall commitment as a country. Second component is this notion in neoclassical economics that, you know what, it doesn't really matter if we were to lose uh, all of these, the, all of these uh, high-tech industries or advanced technology industries. I, I won't say who it was, but there was the president of a leading international policy think tank in Washington that was asked a few years ago, if we were to lose all of, uh, you know, how much manufacturing could we lose in trade because of globalization, and how, how much could we lose uh, and have it still be okay? And his answer was all of it. We could lose all of it. It doesn't matter. It, how, who are we to decide that some industry is more important than others? And if the new global economy has a division of labor that says we don't do any manufacturing anymore. No more Boeing, no more Intel, no more Amgen, no more General Motors. None of those. We lose them all. 
the head of this major international policy think tank over on some street that Brookings is on, uh, said it's okay to lose it all. Uh, this is utter nonsense. It's not okay to lose it all. What would we make? What would we, what would we sell to other people to pay for our imports? That's what trade is partly about. So that's where you have to come to the second point is trade in, and globalization only work if we have a robust domestic competitiveness policy. Other countries have it. So we have this view, well, we're just going to go out there and compete. We're, it'd be, be like going out and saying, you know, we're going to go out in the NFL, but we're not really going to do a training camp because that's for sissies. We're just going to go out there and, and, and just hope we win. We need the training camp. The training camp is things like investing in science and technology, investing in workforce skills, uh, a more robust corporate tax code, et cetera, et cetera. Keynesians, I would argue, uh, Look, they're on this sort of uh, Don Quixote uh, uh, view that somehow if they just keep working, they can bring us back to the 50s. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, container ships aren't going away. The internet's not going away. Global integration is here to stay. What they need to do is recognize that, and instead of putting all of their political effort into, into opposing trade and trade deals, they should really put their efforts into those two points there, making sure that we fight mercantilism and making sure that we have a robust national competitiveness strategy. So with that, I will stop, and I'll look forward to hearing uh, from our, uh, our respondents, starting with John. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rob. Um, uh, Rob and I met probably a couple, two or three years ago, and uh, I've enjoyed our, our exchanges over the years uh, because I think you bring an important voice to the discussion. I had, my first boss in Washington was a uh, senator from my home state, Bill Cohen, who was very thoughtful and continues to be a very thoughtful person, went on to become Secretary of Defense. As soon as you know. He used the phrase, he didn't invent the phrase, but he quoted it often. And he, and he talked about camps of people being either uh, uncritical lovers, unloving critics. And I thought it was a great turn of phrase, and I think it, it applies to the trade debate. You know, you have these sort of uncritical lovers, you know, free trade, haven't met a free trade agreement or, a free, or a, the appearance of a free trade policy that wasn't worth embracing, and then you also have, you know, what I would describe as unloving critics, people who frankly just, um, when you, if you scratch the surface, they just don't support trade, and if they could flick a switch, they would like to see a protected uh, U.S. economy. And Rob, uh, uh, I'm pleased to say, and as you saw just moments ago yourself, uh, doesn't fall into one of those two camps. And for that reason, I think he's a great contributor to the debate. And I think his paper and, and Michelle, I want to applaud them for, I think, a, a very useful contribution. Um, I, I suppose, like everyone in the room, you know, I've over the years struggled with what is the right trade policy approach for the country, and I've come to a couple conclusions. One is that one's view of trade policy usually reflects their view about the role of government generally, and uh, I'm no different. And so, before I get to sort of offering a few comments about my current thinking about trade policy, um, uh, and I would describe myself, uh, the, the phrase where I was a little, that I had used to describe myself was a little different. I describe myself as a frustrated free trader as opposed to a reluctant free trader. I'm actually firmly a supporter of free trade, but I, I feel frustrated for reasons I'll explain in a moment. But the, um, my views of government are that if you look around the world, the countries, the societies, the economies that are struggling the most are those with weak governments. Um, they have weak rule of law, they have limited uh, participation in governance and in government, and therefore suffer. So I'm a huge fan of strong governments. Um, and in that sense, I, I make that point because sometimes kind of the free, art, ardent free traders are sort of put in this box of, you know, the government is the problem. And in fact, the government is not the problem. Government is the solution in a macro sense. Rule of law, 
good infrastructure, enforceable contracts, macroeconomic policy, et cetera. Where I, where I depart from the strong, vigorous government uh, camp is when you get down to individual firms. And that's where you sort of creep, you, you, you move towards, I guess the phrase that's commonly used now is crony capitalism. And I worry about crony capitalism. I see it, I see it in this country, I see it in other countries at a far greater, uh, to a far greater extent. And that's what, that's where free trade agreements to me really come in and what they're designed to do. They're designed to create white space, space where government is not supposed to intervene and the, the market participants are supposed to be able to compete on the proverbial level playing field. And um, it sounds like a stretch, but I think of free trade agreements and the WTO agreements as coming from a similar thread as our Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights is about creating white space where the government is not supposed to operate uh, and, uh, and intervene. And in an economic sense, I think of trade agreements as serving that purpose, like the government shouldn't be putting its thumb on the scale for this individual company or sector. Uh, and when it does, it's, uh, it's not only, I think, economically inefficient and ultimately not in that country's long-term interest, but it is detrimental to traders, to countries and uh, competing firms in other countries. And for that reason, where I, where the reason I've come to describe myself as a frustrated free trader is not because I've backed off from my strong belief in open markets and more white space, not less white space. It's that when we look at individual debates, we too often, I think, we're saying, oh, no, I'm a free trader. We can't respond to this country who's acting in a very unfair, non-free trade uh, manner. And we should do something about it. And I think that part of the debate is, I think, just in the past three years has moved more and more, I wouldn't say to the center. But it's now acceptable in free trade uh, uh, parlors around town to say, look, you know, country X is doing Y, and that is, we just have to respond to that without saying, well, you know, let's either take the short-term gains from those subsidies to our consumers, or look, we really have to just suck it up because if we respond, they'll respond and we'll have the proverbial trade war. And I just don't think that's a sophisticated and, and, and sufficient response. And I think we'll become less and less uh, sufficient uh, uh, a, a less and less sufficient response as we see more and more intervention by our trading partners that frankly are intervening on behalf of their companies and sectors. And so um, last year the Peterson, I'll conclude with this because it's an example of what I'm, what I'm talking about. Last year the, the Peterson Institute came out with a book on uh, economic normalization with Cuba. And I, I encourage them to do this because you know I knew at some point there, at some point there is going to be a normalization. But the question is, what will that look like? And if you look at the current debate about Cuba, it kind of reflects these two camps that are that are reflected in, the, in more broadly in, the, in trade debates. You know, you've got one camp, you know, end the embargo today, normalize quote normalize today. And then you have others that you know are so. Um, have such strong views about the Castro government and what it what it has done, and I frankly understand those views, and I'm very sympathetic to those views. But I say, you know, we shouldn't we should not be trading with this with this country. At some point, there's going to be um, a, a new relationship. I, 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 I can't predict if that's six months, six years, or sixty years from now. But there will be a new relationship. And what the Peterson report focused on was this relationship should be based on reciprocity. We shouldn't, you know, end the embargo if the situation results in just basically a, a Russia-like oligarchic economy in Cuba. We all pat ourselves, all us free traders pat ourselves on the back and say, we've opened up a trade with Cuba. Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's such a good thing if, we've, if, if the economy there is basically just five or six carved up state-owned enterprises. That that's such a good thing for us, for U.S. Uh, economic policy, U.S.
competitors to those to those SOEs in Cuba. And I, and that's I just use that as an example of we need to get beyond sort of this this sort of top line. Are you a protectionist or a free trader? And drill down. That I think Rob has a very thoughtful way to say, well, let's look at our interests. Are they being served? Um, or are they not? And to do that, you have to, like every other policy issue in Washington, you have to dig a little deeper to unpack what those policies actually are. So, all right, Chuck. Okay. Thank you, John. Josh. Um, thanks, and um, yeah, Rob. Thanks for having me. And um, again, I think it's an excellent paper. I think similar uh, to what John was saying. I think one of the key contributions is that it really highlights how sterile the conflict um, becomes in Washington, um, this free trader versus protectionist um, divisions. And you know, I think you make a very uh, convincing uh, argument how you can still obviously believe in open markets and free trade, but still believe in the real ways um, of doing it without necessarily therefore being labeled a protectionist. Um, so, but I think in the spirit of the debate, um, I'm going to provide some comments to, to continue the conversation. As I was reading the paper, I sort of was going through each of the economic doctrines. I sort of, for each each moment, I sort of had this aha moment. So I was sort of reading about what are, you know, the finders of liberal neoclassical. So like, that's it. And then I read about the Keynesians. I had some sympathy with that. And then ultimately, I read about innovation economic economists. I thought absolutely. So there was sort of like a conversion process going on here. Um, I think you were quite successful. Um, but I think sort of looking in this sort of spirit of being pluralist. Um, I'm going, to, um, I, I think I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about um, where I think that um, the doctrines presented in the paper are some of the partial views um, and what they might mean there for, for trade policy. So I think particularly if one looks at, say, you know, the liberal, um, you know, neoclassical or conservative views, um, you know, I think you can believe in, in the importance of allocated efficiency without necessarily taking the policy position that all government intervention is sort of problematic because it distorts markets and prices. So for example, you know, you take the classic case of, of externalities, you know, whether we're talking about climate change, or whether we're talking about health policy, I think you can carve out very important and significant places for, um, for government policy there. Um, and, and you talk about this a bit in your paper, which is, um, you know, the idea that people are not rational or utility maximising, and this can actually be um, something that happens systemically, and I think there's a place for this also in these other economic doctrines. So I guess on that front, I think that you know you could take the position that allocative efficiency is, is important and still think that there's an important role for government uh, policy here. On, on the Keynesian or neo-Keynesian front, um, you, you, there's a little less of that um, in the paper. The focus sort of is on their emphasis on distributional outcomes. Uh, but I think also their uh, you know, market layers um, in particular and, and lack of equilibrium are uh, key sort of insights coming out from that economic doctrine. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about um, the, the, uh, what this might mean for the trade and trade policy. So a big part of the paper is this sort of this distinction between, um, you know, the problems with sort of the comparative advantage view of, of trade and the, um, the advocate, what you advocate in terms of you know, the need for a more robust competitiveness policy. And um, I th for my understanding, I think part of the view here is that you know, comparative advantage is, is limited or wrong because you can acquire comparative advantage in a sense through you know, an appropriate competitiveness policy. But I still tend to think, so I don't see them necessarily as being that, that different. And, and I think this is sort of one of the questions that's sort of left over in the paper, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Um, because I think if you talk about, say, for instance, I think you can still talk sensibly about comparative advantage in some areas. So for instance, US gets comparative advantage in high skills, um, services, exports, for instance, and a lot of this has quite quite been acquired in the sense that the government's provided, you know, the long terms of educational foundation and a lot of the R&D support that's gone with it. Um, and similarly, you know, we can I think sensibly talk about comparative advantage in terms of developing countries and manufacturing and low wage industries um, and the like. So, um, but I do agree that comparative advantage has its limits, certainly when it comes to explaining um, trade flows and providing a context of thinking about trade policy. Because as you point out, there's a lot of trade that the US does, actually most trade is with advanced economies. So a lot of this is also about um, you know, providing opportunities for specialization and economies of scale. We can get into that in your paper. 
On, on the competitiveness uh, front, um, I, I absolutely agree that you can certainly have a competitiveness policy that can affect the competitiveness of particular industries. I mean, you talk about the uh, solar panel industry in China, and that's a great example, I think, of where you know, the government subsidies and the like has essentially built that industry up from scratch. And this sort of leads to another part part of your um, argument, which I, I tend to have a different view with, but I, I, I do, um, I, I don't want to make this a strong point, which is sort of this question of do countries compete or not. Um, I, I t still tend to be on the improvement side of the debate, but I still do think that um, you can lose competitiveness in a particular industry, whatever that industry may be, for whatever that particular reason, without necessarily coming to the conclusion that countries are competing and I don't think this is necessarily because of the claim in the paper that it is sort of making allocative efficiency sort of the primary goal here, but I think it's simply because industries at the end of the day are not nations. Um, and I think you can still hold these positions and still be very concerned about a lot of things you're concerned about. So for example, um, intellectual property theft um, remains highly problematic for the US simply because it's theft and it has significant costs not only for the industry but also broader social costs for the US in terms of RNG and its impact on innovation. So I thought I'd, I'd have, you know, you provide a great, um, you know, this sort of really gets to the key question I think if you raise it, like what would a competitiveness policy look like um, for the US? And you use this, uh, you, you provide a great illustration of this sort of, you know, having chips and computer chips um, way to illustrate this. And I think your, your broader point here is that, um, you know, competitive policy should be supporting high value now, I thought I'd take uh, this very specific example and try to argue against it. Um, because it's not clear to me necessarily why government policy would support computer chips on competitive chips. Um, and and here's, here's my take on this. Um, so, if you, a, 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 a potato chip that was, for instance, uh, genetically modified, uh, possibly organic, had been well branded and marketed, and possibly using Idaho potatoes, is, is arguably quite a significantly value on the product. Um, when you look at computer chips, um, absolutely there can be a lot of value added there, but I think at the same time, when you look at the computer chip industry, it's globalised and also highly commodified. Um, in some respects, like a potato chip. So I think my point simply is that um, the, the, there's a key question here, which is, you know, what does all this mean for trade policy? And it's one thing which I think is, could be better fleshed out and you do this actually, did this a little bit in your presentation, which is simply um, how does government distinguish between the value added industries we're supporting? I think this sort of possibly touches on um, what John was saying in his presentation. So, John, in your, um, Robin, your, um, you, 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 in your presentation, you fleshed that out a little bit and you sort of started talking about things such as um, you know, tax and infrastructure and, and the like, and I would actually wholeheartedly get behind that, and I don't think that's that's a highly controversial position, but if we're sort of leading into um, more, uh, you know, uh, direct government support and, and of very specific industries, I think that's where yeah, we end up in, in a debate, which I think we've had before, which is where you, you end up in sort of um, difficult world of private capitalism, or we used to call industrial policy, which, you know, at, at an extreme level have proven not to work necessarily, then I think it's a different kind of position. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Can everyone hear me now? Okay. Thank you, Rob. I'm very happy to be the cleanup batter. Um, let me start by congratulating you and Michelle on a very thoughtful paper, rich in historical detail and also in outlining the uh, current dilemmas that we face. Um, Michelle masquerades as a trade policy analyst, but I think that through this paper, she has really shown um, what an outstanding contribution she's making to the field of economic policy and also trade policy. So thank you especially. Now that she's blushing. <laughs> um, let me uh, start with the following. Uh, since our panel involves trade trench warfare, I thought I would start with three pearls of wisdom from Clausewitz, famous general who wrote on war. His first pearl of many was, <clears throat> war is nothing but a continuation of politics by other needs. 
So translated into trade talk, we could say trade wars are nothing but a continuation of economics by other means. Clausewitz also said, there are very few men, and there are exceptions, who are able to think and feel beyond the present moment. Maybe it's a good thing he didn't put women in there. Let's transpose that into, there are very few people, and there are exceptions, who are able to think and feel behind the present moment, especially when discussing trade. And he also remarked that the enemy of a good plan is the dream of a perfect plan. So it's fair to say here that the enemy of a good trade agreement is the dream of a perfect one. How does Clausewitz help us understand the intellectual underpinnings of the current debates over trade? Well, first of all, it's very easy to get wrapped up in doctrinal positions, as Rob so eloquently illustrated. But in my view, they're not going to shed a whole lot of light on how we can boost jobs and growth. It's also not what most people are arguing about, which is ideological, with apologies to my dear friend Milton Mueller. I think in this case, it's more of an ideological debate uh, in terms of current events and development than a doctrinal one. There's a growing divide between those people who want to see more trade agreements and those people who don't well, want to see less. And for some, the perfect number, the um, trade optimality number here is zero. But like many issues, in reality, the debate is neither black nor white. They're rather shades of gray, not to be confused with the popular novel with a similar title. So where does the truth lie? When neoclassicists and neo-Keynesians start to look at the other side's view, as, as Rob has uh, suggested, and acknowledge the gray, and as innovation economists are starting to do. Let's take the subject of job loss. Is it caused by trade agreements or not? It's a very serious topic for discussion. As I wrote in a paper I did in the fall on why trade matters, a number of studies have looked at this question and concluded that the causality is not established. Advances in technology, advances in globalization, bear much more of the burden and the blame here. About 4 million Americans are separated each year from their jobs involuntarily due to shutdowns, due to layoffs, even when the overall number of jobs is rising. So NAFTA, for example, is often criticized for significant job loss. But if you look at the seven years after NAFTA passed, you'll see that seven million jobs were added to the US economy, and the unemployment rate dropped from 6.9% to 4%. At the same time, there are legitimate concerns that need to be discussed and need to be addressed. One solution is to build strong protections into new trade agreements, such as high levels of labor protection, environmental protection, safeguarding the intellectual property that supports about 40 million US jobs, as the Obama administration is trying hard to do. Second, let's not lose sight, as in war, of the ultimate objective here, which is creating economic growth and jobs. And we can have a very good discussion about whether a potato chip factory that might actually support more jobs in the US than a high-tech chip factory really does for the US's competitive and comparative advantage. Um, but let's not lose sight of the objective of trying to boost growth in order to create and sustain more jobs. Increasing trade is definitely one way to get there. And trade agreements are, for better or worse, the only realistic way to reduce the barriers, whether they're trade barriers or they're non-tariff barriers, uh, tariff barriers or non-tariff barriers, to reduce those that inhibit greater growth. Why? Well. There is nothing, there is nothing free about trade without a trade agreement. Unilaterally lowering tariffs is rare. The United States does that with respect to the poorest countries. <clears throat> Europe does it also somewhat uh, to a lesser extent, but others do not do it for us. So if the United States were to sit outside of the Trans-Pacific Partnership or not to be negotiating the transatlantic uh, trade investment partnership with the European Union, we would find ourselves rather lonely as others, including Europe, Japan, China, just to name a few, forge ahead. And countries like China would be then setting the standards for others to emulate. 
I think there are very few of us in this room who would choose to be in a place where China, and no disrespect to China, um, but where China would be calling the shots, whether it be on trade, whether it be on internet policy issues, whether it be on intellectual property rights protection, or a host of other issues. The third, the third observation is that part of being realistic in admitting that there's no such thing as a perfect agreement is, in my view, critical to getting over the hurdles in the next few months. Because by definition, if my side in a negotiation gets everything that they want, then the other side does not. And so the challenge, of course, is to find that sweet spot, to find the positive uh, sum game that does exist. In other words, the win-win scenario that I believe can bring both of these agreements across the finish line and hopefully to a positive vote in the US Congress and also in the legislatures of the other members of these new partnership. But it's the win-win scenario, not the perfect agreement, that has, I think, the best promise for making these, uh, these agreements possible. So I started with a quote, a few quotes, three quotes from Clausewitz. Let me close with uh, another one uh, from a very different historical figure uh, and a different time. And I'd love to hear if anybody can identify who said it and when. Quote, this is the moment when we must build on the wealth that, opens markets, that open markets have created and share its benefits more equitably. Trade has been a cornerstone of our growth and global development, but we will not be able to sustain this growth if it favors the few and not the many. Together we must forge trade that truly rewards the work that creates wealth with meaningful protections for our people and our planet. That, rather, this is the moment for trade that is free and fair for all. Anybody know who said it and when? Obama, probably. Good. When did he say it? State of the Union, right? Hmm? Did he say it in the State of the Union? No. He said it in 2008. He was Senator Obama on his trip to Berlin. But I think it's a great statement because, in a sense, it melds some of the different philosophies. Trade can be equitable. How do we do a better job of doing that? How do we find meaningful protections for our people, for our planet? So, I think it reflects now, almost seven years ago, um, essentially where, where we are today. So I say let's get on with it. Let's figure out which elements of which doctrines we can marry. Um, but let's get on with uh, moving ahead in a concrete way. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mary. So um, let me just respond very quickly <coughs> to um, a few points, and then we'll just open it up for, for questions. Um, uh, first of all, my apologies to John for the reluctant versus frustrated. I think it's kind of a, a big faux pas, so I guess. Frustrated. My, my wife would describe herself as a reluctant spouse. <laughs> uh, as opposed to frustrated. That's a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> the latter. Uh, I think a couple people, uh, uh, Josh and, and John Trigger talked about crony capitalism. And, and if I was writing this about the global doctrines, I would have added a fourth one, which is crony capitalism, I think, or sort of state-directed capitalism. Uh, there are a lot of countries that really have bought into that compliance sugar. I don't really, I don't really believe that we're, that's a doctrine that people in the U.S. subscribe to. Sometimes eeks, it works its way out in how policy gets made. But I don't think there's anybody in the U.S. who thinks, oh, this is great, man. We should have the government picking particular firms based upon how much campaign, campaign cash was done. But I think that is a doctrine in, in other countries. Um, Josh, I'm glad to hear that I may have converted you. My goal in life is basically, I'd like your hope witness with one soul at a time. And uh, <laughs> perhaps I have converted you. I would I hope you would take the test and then send me an email as to, as to what, you, what you scored. Um, <clears throat> this notion about price and all, I, yes, absolutely. So there are some hardcore neoclassicalists who would deny almost all market failures, and then there's sort of the soft core, if you will, and maybe more liberal neoclassicalists who say, yeah, there are market failures, and R&D and pollution are, are one of them. We might have an R&D credit and, and a pollution tax. I think the difference, though, with, with when you really dig down into the innovation economics literature is that they would argue that's true for conventional commodity-based industry bottles of water, or shoes, or wheat. It really doesn't describe innovation markets that are much more complex and really are rife with market failures to the point where it really almost doesn't make sense to talk about market failure. 
talk, it makes more sense to talk about innovation systems and maximizing their performance. So I do think that's a difference, and we can go into that at, at another time. Um, the argument, though, about whether, you know, if we lose an industry uh, like semiconductors, the, argue, the problem I have with, with the, the hardcore neoclassical view is it's, it's circular logic. If we lose semiconductors, it's because we didn't have comparative advantage. So there's no industry, really, that you cannot lose and have it be okay. We didn't have comparative advantage. We, we were like Britain trying to make wine. Why didn't we know that? So there's sort of this view that, you know, there's nothing you can lose on that. And I think that's, I know you're not saying that, but there are people who say that. With, hogs. Pardon me? Hogs. I, I think we could lose hogs, yes, that'd be great. Uh, this sort of Krugman I can point that do countries compete, as Stephen Zell and I, I think, at least attempted to counter that in our book, Innovation Economics. And Krugman's really, that argument sort of boils down to three things. One, at one level, we don't compete in the sense that, you know, 70% of our economy is non-traded, and so our retail sector doesn't compete with the Chinese retail sector, our uh, logistics, et cetera. So yeah, so a lot of what happens in the US economy is irrelevant what goes on. You know, do we have innovation and productivity in our non-traded sector? Really important question. But then there's the trading part that we fight for. And, and at one level, we don't fight for it. So I'm happy to have Happy Meal toys made in China wherever many happy meal toys, because that's not our comparative advantage. I'm happy to have you know, t-shirts with, uh, you know, with Obama's picture on them made in China. So yes, that's win-win, okay? You know, so it's more, better global division of labor. I think the real issue, though, is around more around higher value added advanced technology industries. That's where the competition is really. And yes, so parts of global trade are about win-win, are about division of labor. There's a whole chunk of it, though, that's just about capturing a limited amount of global value. So the amount of global value in biotech is limited. It will grow in the industry, but it's limited. And countries are trying to take that. And I think that's a you know, legitimate thing. It's a question of how you try to take it. So that's where I do think we do compete. Um, last point, I think, Josh, you did about, about potato chips versus computer chips. Yes, now I'm, I'm making sort of a broad generalization, almost a caricature. I think the key question, though, is first of all, do you, not do you, but would someone agree that there could be differences between industries and firms in terms of the relative importance to the U.S. economy? If you don't buy that, then, but if you do buy that, the real question is what's the methodology we would have as a, as a society or a government to begin to ascertain that? And I wrote a recent little book uh, called Understanding and Maximizing America's Evolution and Economy that tried to lay out a methodology. What do the industries have in common that we would do? And I think that's just a question we have to have a, a dialogue, research, analysis, and debate on that. Because you're right, I mean, there are certain components of textiles, for example, nano based textiles, smart textiles, uh, that, that are very complex. And, and we have some competitive advantage in that. So you're right, sort of gross generalizations are not the way to think that through. Um, the last point, I think, about. about you know, I, I differ from neoclassical economists because the sort of liberal neoclassical economists are, are, are more willing to say there's a role for government funding research. I mean, a lot of conservatives basically say we shouldn't even fund research because the corporate sector will take that up, which is just not shown to be true. But I think there, I think you can go a step further than just kind of framework conditions to things like, for example, the Obama administration's and NMI initiative, the National Network of Manufacturing Innovation, which you've been very, very strong supporters of. Is that picking winners? Yeah, sort of. I mean, it basically said that we think as a country that additive or 3D manufacturing is going to be important to our future. So we're not picking a particular firm. We're not even to add, we're, a, we're not even picking a particular type of additive. We're just saying additive is important. Let's create a public-private research cooperative partnership, pre-competitive, bring universities, community, community colleges, and firms together. I think that's fine. I think it's good. And so it's a little bit farther than some would go. Uh, Miriam, um, I think your point about acknowledging shades of gray is, is absolutely right, and um, uh, I think both sides, obviously all sides, fall into that. But I, I just would argue, I just would, would, would I, I think the jobs point to me is a funny one because there's a recent kerfuffle over a USTR claim about jobs and the TPP and are they double counting? And you know, one economist, I, I think, rightly, pardon me, 
Oh, it was Carrie who was double handed. Yes. Careful about that. Assigned blame. That's right. They're not part of state. That's why they're very sensitive yeah. to that. Exactly. No, it was Carrie. No, US Carrie would never make that mistake. Um, but the one, one economist was quoted, I think, in the Times on this. Said, look, in the long run, trade agreements don't create jobs, nor do they lose jobs. And I think that's the right way to think about it. It's, but each side, when they're going for that advantage on the war purpose, this is going to create jobs. This is going to lose jobs. Look, trade agreements at the end of the day have no effect on jobs. What, now, they have an effect on certain jobs, but in the long run, labor markets adjust and get back to equilibrium. Where they have an effect is on, on sort of the nature of those jobs, the kind of production, and that's a much different. So I think, have, I think you can make an argument that trade has an effect on incomes and, and national. Um, and I know you're not saying that, but I just, it's interesting how both sides of this debate will jump into that. So unless somebody has a response, I will open it up. Uh, folks, uh, just raise your hand. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, my name is Pat Malloy, and I want to start out by quoting you. You said, what do we sell to other countries to pay for our imports? And I was struck by the, nobody here talked about balancing trade. My understanding, the United States is going to run a 500, well, in 2014, we ran $500 billion trade deficit, $340 billion with China. And my further understanding is that when you run negative net exports, according to the economist, it detracts from GDP growth. And so, would it make sense for the United States to set a goal to balance trade and then figure out trade policies that could help us achieve that goal? My understanding, the reason we could run these massive, ten, last uh, 20 years, $10 trillion worth of trade deficits is because we have the reserve currency. So we send paper dollars out of the country to, to import the goods that we're importing. The other guys end up with the dollars, and then they can come back and foreign investment buy your industry. So I see this as a very dangerous game that we're running when we run these massive trade imbalances year after year. So just a quick response to that. We talk about that in the, in the, in the paper and argue that generally neoclassicalists ignore or deny that the trade deficit could be a problem, largely arguing it's an accounting uh, uh, equation that, that uh, savings uh, has to equal the trade deficit, and if we just save more, there'd be no trade deficit. I don't think the evidence supports that, frankly. But I do think this question of do you think the trade deficit is a problem is, is very much about doctrine. Uh, one last thing, Pat, I'll say, it's actually not the trade deficit that causes job loss, it's the change in the trade deficit in, in, in Keynesian national income accounting. If the trade deficit goes up in the short run, I, I think the problem with the trade deficit is, is, a, is, is twofold. One is it's a long-term debt, like the national debt. It's a, it's a debt that at some point we will have to pay. At some millennium, we will have to run trade surpluses. This country will just stop giving us things for free. I mean, the Chinese are basically shipping over two or hundred billion dollars of products and getting nothing in return. Dollars. Well, you can't do anything with a dollar until you convert it into a good or service. You can buy things on your place. They're not buying things here. That's my point, is they're loaning us money. And, they're, and that's the key point here. They're, they're getting no value from the dollar. They're buying houses and education for their children. But actually, they aren't, because that would, that would lead to a or that would lead to a trade balance if they were doing that. Uh, but my only point on this is, that, is at some point the Chinese, as the Japanese will do, I think sooner, will demand that they actually take some of our products so that they don't have to, they, they get more current income. They're, what the Chinese are doing is sacrificing current income for future income. What we're doing is sacrificing uh, future income, uh, uh, future consumption for current consumption. At some point, that's going to have to change. And I think that's a big problem. I'll let other folks. Well, I would say, I mean, it seems it, it, to take what you're suggesting to its logical conclusion would be to run a managed economy. And I don't think for many reasons the United States um, would be comfortable uh, doing that. I think it's very hard to balance exactly imports and exports. Um, the point that I tried to make uh, is the more we can boost our exports, keep in mind 95% of the world's customers live outside the United States. So we have a large market domestically, but it's limited. The more that we can export and tap into markets that 
not um, yet been as significant as they might be for U.S. manufacturers and farmers and service providers, um, the more jobs we can both sustain and create at home. Um, so I differ a little bit with, with Rob on this because I do think there's um, a positive relationship uh, over time between boosting our exports and being able to keep the job growth up. Now, there are many other factors that can sometimes obfuscate that relationship. But, but I do think it is a positive one, even if people sometimes get carried away with the numbers. Um, I also think that, well, historically, uh, I don't know, Rob, you may have the current numbers, but historically, a large part of this <coughs> deficit has been because of its import of uh, oil and petroleum products. So that's obviously going down. In certain countries, it's, it's very significant, or has been, but that's changing now. Um, the third point I would make is to keep in mind when you're looking to boost exports, um, <coughs> It's not shocking that your imports would also rise. Some of it is consumption-based, but some of it is also bringing more imports to make more products to export. It goes to um, it's one of the questions I have about the debate between competitive advantage and competitive advantage, when in fact we're really talking about global value chains, where many partners, many countries, are now adding value along the way. So I think that, in some sense, also um, makes it harder to argue that one country and only one country has an advantage in, in certain products. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. Thanks for a very good discussion. A question arising from Rob's notion of thinking about trade policy um, strategically. Actually, before I said that, I just want to note on behalf of my mom, who's from Iowa, I want to jack from that all the time. <laughs> so, having noted that for the record, I have a question about strategic choices in trade policy. So, we're you know we're busy trying to conclude the TPP, and everybody's rallying around it. If you look at our trade relationship with Asia, it's been one where we've suffered a lot from the mercantilist practices that Rob talks about. Trade balance is not very good with Asian countries, and yet that's our, our focus right now. If, if, if you're thinking about okay, negotiating an agreement that maximizes U.S. advantage, all these agreements are trade diverting to some extent. I mean, we understand that they favor some regions over another. I wonder why we are not focusing instead on deepening the relationship in North America. I mean, I was really struck in some of the testimony we've seen recently. We actually run a very slight manufactured trade surplus in North America right now. If you take out fossil fuels, and there's some debate over the numbers. But I think the reason for that is these are fairly integrated economies. So if you look at this global value chain notion that Miriam's talking about, when we import something from Mexico, 40% of the content of that product is American-made, because we send a lot of parts over to Mexico, and they send them come back to the U.S. With China, I think the figure is somewhere around 7%. So why are we focusing on deepening our relationship, just from an economic perspective, put the geopolitics aside, deepening our relationship with a part of the world where the trade advantage seems much less to us? I mean, why are we focused on, on deepening North America where there would seem to be a lot of competitive advantage to be gained for the United States? Yeah, I think there's a study I saw years ago that said there was more trade between uh, Toronto and Vancouver than Seattle. There's a border that we would want to get rid of. As well. So I'll let other folks take that. Maybe you Sure. Uh, so I, I think the answer is that the United States can and should be doing both. And by Asia, by the Trans Pacific Partnership, it's important to keep in mind not only is that uh, designed to bring down some of the barriers that are keeping the United States from exporting more, both goods and services. Um, so I think there's going to be a net plus there. But it also embraces now Canada and Mexico, so it enables us to update NAFTA through stronger labor and environmental provisions. And it also already includes Chile and Peru, so two of the fast-growing uh, economies in South America. And there are others that want to join as well, both in Asia and in South America. So also other places, but <laughs> that's the main focus right now. Um, so I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I would also add um, that um, there have been studies done showing that with U.S. trading partners, so with those countries with which there is an existing trade agreement, if you take out oil, there's a manufacturing uh, surplus, but there's also an overall 
goods and services surplus. Yeah, but that, that's all Canada and Mexico, right? That, the, the rest of the partners are very responsible. So that, you're actually making my point, which is a, is a Canada Mexico one. I mean, I do wonder about the, the Asia, and I'll, I'll just expand a little bit and then I'll shut up. I do wonder about the Asia one. I mean, our experience with trade agreements with Asia is that they don't reduce our deficit, they increase it, in fact. I mean, when the whole debate over China's entry to the WTO was in full, everybody said, well, you know, uh, China's lowering all their barriers, we're not having to do anything. So therefore, our exports are to China. And exactly the opposite happened. So it seems like, in some ways, we're kind of doubling down on a strategy, which at least from a sort of overall trade balance perspective has been a failed one, when we've got alternatives that have actually worked better from that perspective. So I actually do think this is a strategic choice as opposed to, well, we should just do everything. You can't do everything. You actually do have to, to make choices. We've also Japan, the Again, again, looking at the history of Japan, I mean, do we really believe the TPP, the Japanese are suddenly going to start buying a lot more of our goods? I mean, they haven't done this for 35 What's the alternative? Years. Just, just, you know, say, all right, well, no, I'm not going to No, I'm suggesting an alternative, which is to deepen our North American relationship and kind of build up what's, in effect, a kind of hemispheric competitive advantage in a, in a competition with, with Asia. Well, I think it's happening, but it's not much place. So. so I'm going to go in the order I see people. Hi, David Wu, former member of Congress, and uh, I just want to bring a report from inside the uh, sausage factory, and please don't shoot the messenger. I was hanging out with a bunch of uh, members of Congress last night and wanted to share with you a couple of comments on the uh, upcoming votes. And one member said, well, I'm going to vote for TPP, and I'm going to vote um, against TPA. And then another member said, well, um, I don't have strong feelings about this. My constituents don't care about this. So what's in it for me? And he did, the member did not mean what's in it for the member personally, but it was what's in it for uh, my constituents and for my state. So this goes somewhat to Rob's comments. Uh, I think the first member really is pretty much locked in, and you know that's what that split of votes means. But with respect to the second member, the trenches really are movable, and it depends on two things. And one is, what are the arguments that you're going to pitch that this is good for the district, and the second is, uh, in, in you know, if somebody's willing to do something direct, as in locating a factory or R and D center, and that would probably move the trench. And that's my comment. You guys can jump all over it if you want to. That's all Congress, right? <laughs> Our no, I don't think so. I think it's about, you know, they're, they're elected to represent their district, and uh, that's what they do, and uh, nothing wrong with that. But Josh? I'll just jump in quickly. Um, yeah. I'll be, you know, for the sake of, um, you know, being uh, somewhat controversial, I, I think, you know, we, uh, yeah, this is sometimes counterintuitive, but I think we have to, at, at a first level, stop equating trade deficits with a negative thing uh, for the US. There, there's, there's essentially no correlation between running a trade deficit and employment levels and economic growth levels. And in fact, the reverse is true. And, and the reason for this is as follows. It, it's not um, a simple accounting issue when you look at the trade deficits and what actually happens on the capital side. Um, it, it remains true that the trade deficit is ultimately, this is the overall trade deficit. So we can talk about bilateral trade deficits. And there's, they're a completely different story. Um, but the overall US trade deficit is ultimately driven by a gap between how much savings there are in the US and how much investment opportunities there are. And now there's a question of causation, and I'll get to that in a second, right? But essentially, the US has had declining savings. I mean, up until the financial crisis, that has changed, right? And there's a whole variety of actually good reasons for that, which is essentially rising household wealth, um, other, other opportunities which we won't go into. Um, but it's also a product of the investment environment 
US, which is a very positive one. And it essentially means that more funds, more capital flows into the US than there is actually GDP production, which then translates, that gap is essentially translates into imports. Now you can, now the question then becomes, well, what drives that? Is that basically, are we sort of importing too much, not exporting enough, and financing that, which then drives the capital net inflows, or do the capital net inflows drive the trade deficit? And the reason that I think people tend to think that the capital account drives the trade deficit is because the size of the flows on the capital side dwarf the size of the flows on the trade deficit side by magnitudes of, of many. Um, so, you know, Rob's right in that this over time will change. I mean, the US will run a trade surplus at some point, and this will be through adjustments in the um, exchange rate and through basically asset prices. And, you know, it is true, it's absolutely current consumption and deferred consumption. Um, but, you know, there's nothing that really we can do on a trade policy front that will change the side of the trade deficit. Now, when we get to individual bilateral deficits, the thing we've got to think about Asia, I mean, Asia is, China's become obviously the focus for the US for very good reasons, but China's essentially become the amalgamation of a whole series of trade deficits with other countries in Asia, such as um, Japan and Korea, which have moved production over time to China and then exported uh, back to the United States. And it sort of gets to Miriam's point about value chains, where, you know, a lot of this is ultimately, you know, US-Asia trade deficit. So, um, you know, I think, that is sort of an important way of thinking about it. Now, getting getting back to um, you know the congressional piece. I mean, I was at the at Democratic retreat last week talking about trade, and I heard a lot of similar uh, questions raised. And I think it's really the politics that I think of this are really hard because if you're a House member, um, you know, where you're thinking about your district, um, you know, you may have some industries that lose, you may have some industries that gain. And actually, kind of making the case for you know House members, I think, could be Really challenging, particularly when you're looking at a jobs thing. When you're looking at a national perspective, it becomes a different angle here. I don't have any um, necessarily good solutions here, but I think maybe the starting point is actually sort of understanding better in terms of what the gains are nationally for the US. So, right, yeah. uh, real quick, I actually want to connect the, the last two questions, Ted and, and your uh, question, Congressman. I think what's in it for the US uh, TPP, that is, is to try to create more market access in those markets. Ted, you're absolutely right that we trade more with in North America than we do in in Asia, and that'll probably continue to be the case. If anything, it's probably going to solidify over time. I mean, there's this argument, some say that, you know, just the debate about peak oil, there's a debate now, you know, whether we've had peak trade, you know, and, and we're not going to see containers of white goods moving across oceans Ten years from now, and as we move more and more towards uh, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, there's just going to be less of, you know, goods moving across oceans. Uh, I don't know how that will turn out, but I do know we'll. I'm pretty sure that 20 years from now, our major trading partners will be Canada, and Mexico. Um, but I'm also sure that one of the reasons why we have little penetration in some of the Asian markets is because we don't have as good market access to those. And if we had better market access, and that's obviously a key goal of TPP, we would do better in those markets. And that's that's the value proposition for Congress and for, for the country. Uh, just very quickly, Miriam uh, said the words uh, crony capitalism, and I would submit that it is not crony capitalism. Uh, the first part about what's good for the district, I think clearly is not. And the second part about, you know, what specifically can be done for the district. Um, I don't think that is either. Allocation decisions are made all the time in the pub in the private sector, uh, in the private sector and in the public sector. When the administration decides you know, where to build a bridge, where to do a research center, they have to select a place. Um, and uh, maybe it's another market transaction. Can I also just add, add Bill, just quickly on, on a comment John made before. Um, you know, the, the, there are two other things to keep in mind. What, what, if you care about surpluses, the US runs a surplus in services and a growing surplus in services. So, um, in terms of trade policy, um, you know, certainly when you think about TPA, you think about TPP, you know, what really is going to matter for the United States is that on the good side, at least, 
um, in terms of imports, there's going to be probably little to no change. Um, where the real opportunity for the United States lies is going to be addressing the types of barriers to services and exports. And what Miriam said quite accurately is where most of the consumers in the world reside. And this is actually where barriers are high, market access is limited, and where opportunities are very significant for the United States. And I just want to finally pick up on Rob's point, which you made in the introduction, which is also that, you know, and, and John said this as well, I think, is that in, in many respects, um, you know, globalisation, trade, investment is all going to happen without TPP, without TPA, etc. So really the question is not do you like trade, do you like globalisation, is do you want to have a role in setting the terms of how this goes ahead? And that's very much what I think TPP is going to be about. So I think we're on that for one last question, but I cannot let Josh's comments go without a response. So uh, Josh, actually, I, I think actually that the follow-up to this would be usually host a debate over at Berkeley's on some of these questions, and we could rather than have this love fest we're having here, we could uh, try to go down a little more. But I do want to take, uh, take, take uh, objections to this point about the trade deficit. Because um, I think it's a core, it is one of those core defining uh, aspects. So I think if you are in the neoclassical camp, you tend to have this view that trade deficits of accounting function. If you're in the innovation economics camp, you have to have this view that it's a structural economics problem caused by our own policies and the policies of other countries. Uh, one factoid, there's really no correlation between national savings rate and changes in national savings rate and changes in the trade deficit. And the Clinton era, we were massive increase in savings and a big increase trade deficit. So, but my hypothetical question to you, Josh, is so since you don't believe that the trade deficit is caused by anything other than savings, that means we could, uh, congressmen's colleagues could go tomorrow and we could raise the corporate tax rate to 75 percent and wouldn't have any effect on the trade deficit, would it? No, so, so that's, a, that's a trick question. Right. <laughs> 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 ICIF is not advocating 75 percent corporate tax rate. It, it depends. Right. Yeah. And, and look, let me let me just make clear. I mean, there's there's two parts. It's, it's savings and investment. So you know, Ben Bernanke's got this view that you know the trade deficit is ultimately driven by the savings side, right? So you've had essentially, um, and this gets to the role of the U.S. currency, where you've had um, you know Asian governments in response to the Asian financial crisis basically accumulating foreign currency reserves. You had um, Europe, um, you know, countries in Europe for different reasons running surpluses. Um, and you have the OPEC countries, due to oil high prices, having large amounts of savings and basically depositing a lot of that money into treasuries and, and T-bonds, right? And if you look at the flows there, um, you know, a lot of that, from Bernanke's view, is explaining, you know, what's been going on on the capital side, which is why you've had this enormous gap between. So you can have a high savings rate, uh, but you can still have an even higher demand um, in terms of capital inflows, which would still drive the deficit. Corporate tax, 75%? Well, yeah, you know, this this would though play out in, in, through the economy in terms of exchange rates and asset prices. Yeah, no, see that? That's a, that's the camera. Camera. Absolutely, in a in a if if the global economy were structured that currency markets were actually yeah. markets Thank as opposed to manipulating things, I totally agree. That. I mean, we could have high costs here, we could have high inflation, we could have high corporate tax, we could have high healthcare. Market. It all doesn't matter because currency adjusts. We're at international economics 101. The fundamental problem with the entire global trade system. Currency does not adjust. But I'd be happy to argue. I'd be happy to go with you on that, Josh, because we had a high corporate protection. The U.S. dollar goes down. The day the U.S. dollar goes down, there's 10,000 people rioting on Capitol Hill from think tanks saying, We defend the strong dollar. How can you defend a strong dollar if you are for free trade and markets? And those are, to me, in contradiction. Enough of us. I'm sorry, is that time for one last question, sir? Uh, thank you. Uh, Jean-François Boitin, one comment, Craig David, thank you, uh, one comment, two questions. Comment is, it might be that there is an uh, intellectual uh, trade policy trench warfare in Washington, there are many trench warfares in Washington, uh, but I think that on that one, the Keynesians have constantly been beaten, trade agreement after trade agreement, there is, if you look at the history, there is no debate on that. Uh, question number one uh, is, uh, and uh, Ambassador Sapiro alluded to that, most people now talking international trade, looking at the fact that 50% of our international trade is intra-company trade. Uh, people talk about global value chain. How does it impact on these different views of what trade is all about? And the second question is about uh, uh, China, which looks a little bit like the big uh, bad wolf here. 
uh, when Apple manufacture all of its stuff in China, they do it for profit reasons. So is China to blame for that? Uh, let me just quickly go to the same. Look, if China were to not manipulate its currency, to not force U.S. companies to have technology transfer, to not use their anti-monopoly law to extract uh, concessions from companies like Qualcomm, uh, to not sue Apple, to not, I mean, not sue Microsoft, they, we would still make things there. There's no question about it, because it's a low-cost place of doing business. Data. We just wouldn't make as much, and they would import more. That's the it's not a question of a black and white, should China not be part of the global value chain? Should US companies not be in China? Of course they should be. The question is, how much should they be there? And, and that second question related to that is, how much should they be able to take US intellectual property, either through cyber theft, through direct spying, through forced tech transfer, how much should they be able to take of that to gain a uh, competitive advantage for their companies against their companies? And I would argue that's the problem. It's not, and again, that's to me the problem with the debate, but, the sort of Keynesian wing says, we don't like China, we don't want China to be involved in this. And the free trade wing, at least one portion of it, says, hey, we can turn a blind eye to these practices. It really violates the spirit of the WTO. And I think the, the sort of more middle ground, if you will, is to say, we like China, we want them to get rich, we want them to be in the global trade system, we just want them to be able to buy those rules. So, Mary, did you want to respond to the first part? Or? Um, it's great to see you again. I would say, with respect to China, it's, it's not an anti-China issue at all. In fact, you know, the United States, I think for Europe as well, we, we want to have a strong partnership on trade and other issues with China, but we also want them to play by the rules, the rules to which they've already agreed, and perhaps also to rules to which they will one day agree, whether it's trying to forge an update to the information technology agreement, um, which we launched in this room, I believe it was a few years ago, the, uh, the update process, um, or honoring its WTO obligation, or moving ahead with the Trans-Pacific Partnership and watching China take note. Um, none of that is directed against China, but I think it could be part of, of uh, a closer relationship at one day in the future. In terms of the global value chain, I think in Apple, it's a, I'm glad you asked the two questions together because the iPhone is the quintessential example of just how many countries add value along the way. And while it looks, when it's booked uh, on the US ledger, it looks like um, an export from China and import to the US. When you actually break down the components, if we valued that differently, um, the, the uh, significance would be a lot less and it would really change. And that's another reason why it's very hard to look at the um, trade deficit uh, as a black and white issue there's so many variables that go into it and how we value it, and maybe there's a better way to do it. Um, before I close, this is probably my last chance at the mic, I just want to say, for the record, I'm um, against crony capitalism, but I am for hog production. <laughs> um, because I think we have a competitive advantage in the US, especially um, using technologies uh, in agriculture pr uh, production um, that, uh, that I think holds great promise subject of another Brookings debate, hog production, good or bad. <laughs> uh, with that, I apologize for going over a few minutes. We can do from the prior call stopping on time, but I think there's just a, a lot of interest in this, in this uh, panel. So uh, first of all, please uh, join me in thanking uh, three great panelists. Thank you all for coming. Oh, how are you? How are you doing?